Welcome back to the Rugby League Digest. I'm Michael Adams here with Andrew Paskin. G'day, mate. Uh, you, you're all here for the for the rebirth of the show. We're previewing our upcoming season, uh, which, as we alluded to a month or so ago, we're switching to straight history. And the cat's out of the bag. This year, we are going to provide the definitive account of the Super League War. Is there anything to talk about? <laughs> well, th- this is one of the reasons, one of the main reasons I wanted to start here is I feel for the effect it's had on all of our lives and all it is kind of talked about, it- it's so rarely talked about in detail. It's almost like almost like World War One, where it was so painful that everyone blocked it out. Mm. For you know, decades until yeah. you know there were some historians looking into it. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, I mean, don't want to equate it to like World War One, but <laughs> uh, in rugby league terms, it was a holocaust. Yeah, I, I think we're the we're the perfect age to be discussing this. We, you're slightly older than me, but we were both mid teens. When I was Super- fifteen in the in the in the heyday of Super yeah, League. Yes, so I, I was fourteen when when Super League broke in '95. So we were. We were young enough that rugby league was still kind of magical and, you know, your, your world was very small and, and stuff like your rugby league team and watching games like was, meant so much, you know. I was two years off crying when Ricky Stewart broke his ankle in the 93 <laughs> finals. That's how much it meant to me. And uh, I was obsessed with rugby league in 15. Yeah. Obsessed. But at the same time, we were old enough to not be, you know, completely clueless about you know, the off-field stuff and, you know, the, the fact that there was a world beyond rugby league and maybe rugby league wasn't a, as perfect as we might have thought it was a few years prior. Why I'm so excited about this project is I know what research you've got in the bank for a start, but the fact that we can provide our own first-hand accounts, which we haven't been able to do for many of these, uh, even the 88 Brisbane, we were too mm, young. Yeah. And... It's just exciting that we can actually know what we're talking about for yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to start there. You mentioned '88 Brisbane. Like my memory of rugby league pre '88 is very, very patchy. Me too. Oh, I remember '86 right. grand final. My uncle, my dear uncle Ian. Yeah. Um, watching that with him and '87 uh, grand final. Mm. Watched the whole day there. That's about it, really. Yeah, I've got like scattered, like isolated memories here and there. Uh. And, and, you know, a fairly good memory beyond 88. But even in that period, 88 to 94, despite all this excitement, the Canberra and Brisbane era, it still v- felt like very Sydney. You know, maybe you had a different experience. Well, it was referred to as the Sydney comp. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, he's going to come down from Brisbane and play for Sydney. He's yeah. Playing, playing Sydney. <laughs> you know, like it, it was it was the around the grounds era. It still felt very small and self-contained. And 95... In the lead up to ninety five, when you had the four new teams coming in, it already felt like everything was changing. You had the the rebrand to the ARL, and yeah, it did, it really did. Like, it felt small and provincial because it was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, North Sydney had a tree in their ground, <laughs> but it it felt like it it was all changing. and Everything was so exciting, and ninety four we both look back on as. Like that was the year. Like it was just but beyond the fact that it was my ultimate Raiders team, and you know I had the uh, the grand final celebrations with my my dear nan and my uh, my uh, dear auntie is, is now on her sort of last legs currently. It's very emotional for me. We had, I had the streamers and everything. Like it was a perfect day. Mm. My, my nan was gone a year later, and the memories of that for me are just so special. But Putting that personal memories aside, the game was the strongest point. It felt like something was different, something was happening. And I, I think for me, like we're both NBA fans. We both, you know, came through the Jordan era, which was where it all began for me. And f- for younger people now, I don't think they would understand the looming threat of basketball in that era. I was a big NBL fan. At yeah, the yeah, yeah. I was going yeah, to games, I was yeah, playing basketball. Yeah. And Andrew Gay's a signed rookie yeah. card. I, I remember in like kind of 92, 93, like going to rugby league matches with my Beckett basketball <laughs> card magazine <laughs> and ignoring the game to, you know, like, you know, read about like a Penny Hardaway rookie card or something, you know. And, and 
Michael Jordan retired the first time and suddenly like my eyes were like reopened to rugby league and you know it just all happened at this perfect moment where the on-field action with that that 94 Raiders team like like what what a team that was probably not cap compliant we'll <laughs> go out on a limb and say but uh while we're on the subject there needs to be a royal commission into Beckett um management like I don't, I don't know who was running those prices but it was <laughs> Uh, you're so right though. Like we just forget. It. Like now, the NBL is a laughing stock. It's a afterthought. Mm. What the seventh sport or something? Yeah. So it was a genuine competitor mm. to rugby league. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think we'll cut it off there because that it's actually going to come up quite a bit as we go through the season. So uh, I've done so so much research over the last six or seven months on this subject but i thought as as a as a preview and, and at the end of this show we're gonna we're gonna tag on a couple of related history corners but i thought tonight let's drop the research and just get some basic thoughts our memories of the time what's changed in our perspective now so so let's start there so 1995 and you know through the next two years what was your were you pro or anti super league I was definitely pro Super League, and I'll tell you why. My very nature is contrarian. I just hate status quo across the board. And I come from Newcastle, working class school. All my mates were staunch ARL guys to the point where it was fracturing friendships in the schoolyard <laughs> as well as it was in the boardroom. So, um, and. I used to I used to literally graffiti the Super League symbol on the back of chairs <laughs> to annoy people. I love I love the symbol. The symbol to me, the Super League symbol, the S with the football shape, was the greatest piece of design in my young mind had seen. The, the symbol was okay because it had it harked back to the eighties graffiti S in some way. I, I liked the S. I hated everything about the jerseys and the the marketing. I hated the numbers and everything. But like, I, I went to the point where I would support the Mariners, go to the games with five four thousand people, and I had I, had, I went to a Mariners focus group for marketing <laughs> research. They gave me the Mariners polo shirt. I played golf in that Mariners hat, and I'd wear that around proudly. And people would. I'm a fifteen year old kid, skinny as a rake, uh, acne faced. I'm getting death stares from adults in the street, mm-hmm. and I was a weak kid, a pussy. Yeah, and I'll be, I'll be afraid. Like, <laughs> yeah. I was, that's the era we're in. Yeah, yeah. But, but let me ask you this: was your was your pro Super League outlook tied into your support for Canberra? Uh that played a part. But I, 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 I just went into the contrary and stuff. But I, I was seeing, my, I was asking the questions in my mind. Why are we not expanding? What? Why are there so many Sydney teams? These ones don't get any people out. And I was just thinking, and like just reading the rugby league weeks and seeing how the management worked, I was just thinking, this game's not going anywhere. It's like it's the crowds are there and it's it's great, and but we're not looking forward here. <laughs> I, I had that sense even then, mm. and it, what, what they were talking about about going overseas and um, rationalisation and making a national comp like the national comp park hook me in. Like to use the word, it's going to come up a lot in this series. The vision of Super mm, League, yeah, hooked me in. Yeah, so uh, I was right behind it. I thought it was exciting, mm. and I thought it was it's what the game needed to move forward. Yeah, out of out of the seventies. Yeah, well, it it sounds like you were a, a game first kind of person, whereas I was definitely like club first. And most of the the you know the kids I interacted with in the schoolyard and wherever else. Everyone was very like club first, you know. So I was a Dragons fan, so I was pro ARL because they were ARL. I didn't have a single friend who broke like club allegiances. If you went for the Bulldogs, you were pro Super League, you know. If if you went for the Tigers, you were pro ARL. See, to me, I looked at that as like very narrow minded even back then. Yeah, and uh, it it was, but but I didn't see it at the time because when the the Saints East merger was being proposed, and then save our Saints came along were like well let's go to super league then i was like yeah let's go to super league you know it was like it was so club focused i remember the back page saying saints are gone yeah they're going to super league it's happened Mm, yeah it must have been like 11th hour saved 
I can see that with you now, like being such a staunch St. George man, mm. being that it's St. George, I can see you being club f- first. Well, I, f- I feel now I'm I'm definitely game first. but Definitely. But like, I, I mean, j- just your, your passion for the club now, I can imagine as a kid. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Canberra, I was from Newcastle. Yeah. yeah expansion club. Mm. Oh, I think it did play a part though. Yeah. But so that that's kind of like 95, you know, 96 when it was breaking. 97, the actual Super League year, I didn't watch a single second of Super League. Didn't you? No, I, I completely boycotted it. I watched it, I watched it all. I, I didn't watch as much um, ARL because it was, they had the weaker teams. But um, that was the era, 97, 96, 97, when the Sunday League game was cut down to 45 minutes. Mm. And it, I remember just being disgusted. Yeah. Just absolutely crestfallen that the game had come to this mm. where this idiot is lauded as a um saviour of the game of Channel 9 decides I'm going to run Super League against Ariel anyway <laughs> and then I'm going to cut the games down yeah. to a highlights package I couldn't believe it and they're like not you know this this carried on for well after Super League but not playing Friday Night Footy Live because of Burke's backyard <laughs> <laughs> How did we like put up with this for so many years? Burke's backyard, a gardening show. <laughs> it's just, it's absurd, isn't it? There's so many things looking back that don't make sense. When, <laughs> when I mean, you talk about you know the good old days. It's, it's literally like a different country. Mm. So my next question was just the vibe in general. Like, is there anything that stands out to you? Oh, mate, in your so memory? much, so much stands out to me. Newcastle was like. They'd vandalize the Mariner's office. They'd be smashed windows all the time. It was, you hear the word thrown around a lot now, toxic environment. It was toxic. I'm telling you, there was like, there was violence in the air. There was yeah. something like it was a bad time to be around. Mm. The only thing that stopped it was the ARL um, premiership of the Knights. Yeah. Which say, that always annoyed me that they treated that like it wasn't half a comp. They treated that like it was the greatest victory of all time. Yeah. Great grand final, don't get me wrong. Joey, the best player of all mm. time. But we just pretended, the whole city pretended, the whole, whole game pretended that it was not half a comp. The whole game except for one man, Warren Wock Ryan. <laughs> as we discussed in our history corner. <laughs> like, the, the, I, I love it so much that at his first meeting after taking over, he said, you blokes just won half a comp. <laughs> See, Warren and I had a lot of the same views on rugby league. I still do. Um, that really annoyed me. But so, what I this actually shaped my like attitude to life. This um, this is one of the things that d- caused my aversion to hypocrisy. Super League War, the the way the knights were lauded uh, for taking giant pay packets for the yeah, yeah, yeah. like, and then everyone else was demonized. I, I, like just used to infuriate me the hypocrisy of it. Well, it's funny. I, th- I think you definitely had more of a perspective than I did at the time because I, I remember like my dad. He wasn't like pro Super League, but he wasn't like staunch ARL, and like I never really understood it, you know. And like you know, he he didn't like Arco at all, and that's you know probably going back to you know watching watching Manly in the seventies and then Arco taking over it as New South Wales Rugby League boss in 83, you know, like there was a lot of like, um, you know, kind of anger there. We're going to uh, re-release our Arco episode, a History Corner, which is a great episode, so cool. And we both love Arco for the character he is, but calling a spade a spade, the guy was puppeteering for his own club, mm. running the game for, yeah. for decades. Yeah. He had a bit of baggage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I remember at the time, I'd, I'd always hear that, you know, the, the attitude from people who weren't biased either way was kind of like the, the plague on both their houses kind of thing. Like both both sides were complicit. Both had, you know, done some questionable things. There was merit on both sides. So I was hearing all of that, but I never really understood it. Like obviously now, you know, my perspective's changed You might have been a, lot, a little but... bit too young to grasp the, the whole... Yeah, yeah. I was like, by the time it super kicked off, I was 17. Yeah. And, um, you know... Mm. Thinking I was a smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but w- one of the, the main things when I look, when I think back, is that I don't think anything changed in terms of how I was watching the game and how the people around me were watching the game. Like, think about like the, 
the, the Brett Mullins try versus Brisbane in 95, the chip and chase for Mullins, kick and chase again for Mullins. This will be a miracle. Oh, yeah, right. oh it is a miracle. You know, like that was, I remember like watching that, like how electric Brett Mullins was in that era. Well, and- this goes back to our point in the first episode this year uh, about the regeneration of stars. Mm. Through all that turmoil, they were still generating superstars. And I like, I vividly remember sitting down Friday night footy, uh, the Broncos um, diamond jerseys, love them. Uh, I remember watching that game. Travelland. Travelland. And like just being so excited by that moment. And it, to this day, like it gives me chills thinking of, of myself sitting there watching it. Going through all these other on-field moments, my thoughts are like going to school on a Monday morning if the Dragons had had a loss, especially if that loss was against Canterbury, which was the other big followed team at my school. The amount of shit you'd get in the playground. Like for kids of my age, like despite all the turmoil going on, like rugby league was still like the thing, like nothing changed in in terms of how we were watching it and, and what we thought about the players, you know? I mean, I, I had the same, I see where you're coming from. Uh, I think that's, that's from a, a kid's perspective. The adults that I was around, more than half of them, I never watched in rugby league again. Yeah. You know, that's it, my team's gone. Oh, I'm, I'm never going to watch another game. And, and the guys that didn't watch a game for a, a decade. Yeah. Like, I, I'd hear that more than I heard, like, you know, how good is the footy? Well, well I mean, that that's probably a good point to, to pivot into the now and, and looking back and with a bit of perspective. But one of my questions was, has the game truly moved on? I think certainly. I just think there's there's only p- parties that are holding on to the past, certain parties, um, which, you know, are cancerous. But I think it's a new generation. I think the older generation's forgotten about it. They've gotten too old. Uh, I, I honestly think when the NRL came in in 98, everyone was so sick of the war, we sort of moved on quite quickly. I couldn't disagree more really? with that. I, I I feel you get those North Sydney guys never watching like another game type thing. But I mean, on the whole, I'm talking. I really think we're still feeling the the effects of it, and the amount of people that were lost to the game forever. <laughs> you know, it, it'd be interesting to see with the AFL thing. Sydney, the Swans were on the rise anyway. Like I think Super League they definitely, definitely capitalized like, on they it. They cap like it. It was a perfect storm of everything. I wonder where the Swans are now if Super League didn't come along. But that was just a random thought. Keeping it on the actual people we've lost and and the after effects, I I just think it was a lost opportunity. The game needed some bloodletting that was going to be painful and it was going to cause a lot of heartache. But the job was half done. And now I, I always go back to the the amputation analogy. It really is an amputation that you know, went wrong. If, if they'd have like cut an arm off in 95, there would have been a lot of pain. There would have been a lot of grief. There would have been a lot to adjust to. But 25 years later, we would have adjusted to the new normal. What, Instead, we've just carried around this arm dangling half off you, our I, shoulder for 25 years. Your point is, I agree with in the fact that administration-wise, like they could have just put a uh, napalm bomb through Jurassic Park and started fresh with good management, young generation. They didn't do that. But from the fans, from the fans' perspective, I think we've moved on. I, I think there's a number of fans that were lost to the game forever. And the... The ones that are around now, there aren't enough of them to risk going through something similar, which is probably necessary. I, I put it to you, that if you were lost to the game forever, you must have been a questionable fan. If you're watching AFL over rugby league now because of Super League, you weren't going to be staying with rugby league anyway. Yeah, I, I think there's there's degrees to that. Some people went away from the game forever and either lost interest in sports or went for a, a less c- commercial side. Because that was the other thing beyond the clubs, the clubs folding and merging and the rest of it was the the idea that the game had like kind of sold out and was, you know, all, all about money, which like it kind of always was. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of like the whole point yeah. of the game. Um, but 
so there were definitely people that kind of either, you know, just I'm a Jets man, so I'm just going to watch the Jets or I'm just going to watch, you know, local soccer or whatever it is. But the people who did just jump straight on the Swans bandwagon or whatever else, like... Idiots. Yeah. And, and I, I think you're right. Those people were probably never true fans to begin with. <laughs> the one thing about the Super League War that sticks in my mind is that the, the monumental damage to the game, the hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue lost, the, the spent as well. Yeah. <laughs> Not just revenue lost, but money outlaid. Uh, and one of the main themes was that it's fractured friendships of 50 years between administrators. I couldn't care if they dropped dead on the spot. Like, yeah. who cares about their friendships? Yeah. Like, the game's like, services 8 million people. Like, yeah. <laughs> what about us? Mm. They bring out these fractured friendships. Yeah. It's like, it's not nice, but I mean, who who really cares? Yeah. If, if Arco doesn't go to the Chinese restaurant with Peter Moore <laughs> on Sundays anymore. Uh, I think another legacy, which we've already discussed a lot over the past two years, is how much it's muddied the water of individual legacies and team legacies. That stuff at Hall of Fame for oh, so many years. It was so hard to have those discussions when you're trying to weigh up the lack of origins versus the, you know, he couldn't play for three years and, you know, he played three Super League tests which didn't count even though they happened. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, in, in some of the great players, my favourite players all the time, Ricky Stewart, affected drastically mm. their, in their peaks. Yeah. Uh, equivalent of like a long strike in NHL or something, you know. Mm. Or wartime stats and stuff like yeah. that. But, uh, yeah, that really, really caused some dramas, didn't it? Mm. One thing I'll say about it is, it's again another Holocaust reference, which is going to annoy a lot of people. But uh, on a mini scale, it's like we're never going to let this happen again. If a bloke starts to invade Poland, we're going to put our hands up and say, yeah. "Hang on, what's going on here?" Mm. So I think it's left us ever vigilant. Yeah. Uh, on media companies and ownership and etc. Although it does, you know, raise the point that you know who's going to pay for the war this time. And you can't really see a situation where someone looks at rugby league as as being this jewel in the crown, like a jewel in the crown for what you know, like what's the what's the you know the situation that could cause a super league today? I don't know if there is one. Well, sit down on the content again, isn't it? But I think we're actually in a stronger position now because with so much content around you know, online, stuff like that, TV's gone down the gurgler. Mm. And the one thing that still remains strong is sport. Yeah. And I think that puts us in a good position mm. to extort some more money out of them, <laughs> <laughs> to waste. <laughs> so uh, the last thing I want to talk about, you know, my, in terms of my reflective thoughts is just uh, going to tie into what we're going to talk about. Uh, and I, I mentioned at the start the, the lack of uh, interrogation into Super League, which actually astounds me that, you know, Mike Coleman's book, Super League, The Inside Story, came out in like 96, I great think book. it was. Great book. Um, you had Roy Masters' Inside Out, similarly great book, I think the same year or the year after. There hasn't actually been a lot since. But also, you're dealing with guys on certain sides, mm. you know, and they were they were in the thick of it themselves. How, yeah. can they, how can they be objective? How has it gone this long without a proper yeah. invest? There needs to be investigation. Yeah. So, so that that's where we step in. We're going to be covering it from all sides. What one thing I want to get? What, one of my favorite things is to listen to conversations of dickheads in pubs. Love doing it. Love love to hear their. You must have heard me a few times. Eh? <laughs> love to hear their thoughts on everything. And my favorite uh, sub genre of this is saying something completely obvious or the most known thing in the world but giving it this tone as if it's like really profound and you know some some groundbreaking news you have listened to me then <laughs> and, and the one i always hear about super league like someone will like feel real proud of himself and say like mate super league that was just about pay tv <laughs> so like you you go like hey, the war in iraq it's just about oil it's about so, oil mate We'll we'll put that as red, you know. We'll we'll take that as, you know, a- accepted for the course of the season. So, uh, if you are waiting for that bombshell to drop, consider it dropped. We're, we're gonna kind of move forward with hopefully a bit more. <laughs> I've heard that so many times. Oh, mate. So so yeah. So uh, I I've done a huge amount of research, which you're ab- about to to reap the benefit 
benefits of as I as I drip feed it to you and then from there get it out to the listeners. Well, let's talk about a bit of a skeleton here for for the project. We're talking about ninety four kangaroo tour beginnings, whisperings. So what the the way our season is going to unfold is we are going to uh, as long time listeners would have would have listened to our three part uh, dissection of the nineteen eighty seven season, which which I is probably the thing I'm proudest of in the time we've been doing this yeah, show. Yeah, it's magnificent. So our first show in the Super League season proper is actually going to not mention Super League at all, and it is going to be a thorough look at that 1994 season. Just to put listeners in the, the the time frame, the period before the war, before it all broke. It's going to be an emotional uh, journey for me. That one was my favourite year. We're then going to look at the machinations and, and see all the stuff in the years preceding 1995, which caused the war to explode. Uh, and then we're going to go blow by blow from there. And it did explode, didn't it? Mm. I, I just remember the, the the whisperings and me thinking, it's not going to happen. This, this is this is uh, fanciful. Well, that's the thing. It kind it was so stop start, like the point where, like it, you know, March nineteen ninety seven. I still didn't think that we were really going to have two <laughs> comps. You know, <laughs> yeah, but like I mean, rugby league is known for eleventh hour saviors. So you, 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 I think you would have been. Um, I think it would have been well within your rights to think it was going to be stopped at the eleventh yeah. hour, <laughs> but it just goes to show how uh, when you're dealing with media moguls in that era before the digital age, they had the power to switch something on and off with a, with a click of the fingers. Didn't yeah. They? So it was like, well, we're going to take over. Mm. So uh, I, don't, I don't want to go too deep tonight because we we are we, we've got a lot to talk about o- over the next year and, and probably beyond. Uh, any closing thoughts before we... Uh... A closing question for you. Will there be an episode dedicated to Steve Edmund? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I want to save the Edmund talk because it, it's one of my favorite sub-stories of, <laughs> of the, the whole drama. I mean, we're talking about a Hatfield and McCoy's style saga here that this could go for two seasons <laughs> I, I i i really think it will <laughs> so what we're going to do now we're going to replay a couple of history corners that uh will really put you in the mood uh and stop us from uh covering ground that we've we've already tread before so we're going to listen to our ken arthurson history corner and the history corner we did on the, the birth of brisbane both of which directly have led us will directly lead us to what unfolds in super league uh, i want to add just a little caveat we you know recorded these history corners when we knew so much less than we do now based on on all the research that we've done over the last few months so uh you will probably hear some very contradictory views as we go on with the season it's the first thing I just thought. So what did I say in that episode? Christ, <laughs> would have been off the cuff and obnoxious. So c- consider those episodes, uh, you know, the, the rantings of, you know, uneducated Philistines and, and what we produce. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are so, so excited uh, for, the, for the coming season. We've done a lot of work on this and, and I th- think it's, it's something that is very emotional to me and personal. Well, I'll tell you one thing, mate. Um, I'm, I'm, I cannot wait to sink my teeth into it, but this is the last off-the-cuff episode, conversational style. We're going to be a lot more structured now. Mm. I mean, there's still going to be a couple of idiots talking, but uh, yeah, it's, it's your vision, and I, and I support it wholly, is that it's a, it's a definitive uh, historical account with our opinion on top of it. So uh, hopefully with a listener feedback, we can put together a holistic uh you know historical document for this unbelievable <laughs> yeah. saga yeah so uh we will be back very so- soon with the the launch of the season proper in the meantime love to get your opening thoughts on your memories of the time uh what you think should have happened any any thoughts you have about super league would love to hear them so send them into the rugby league digest at gmail.com Hit us up on Facebook and Twitter, and we will speak to you very soon. Toodaloo.
I've read, as I mentioned before, I've read a lot of rugby league biographies over the last year or so. All of them. <laughs> and uh, so I, I thought I'd, I'd, from time to time, give you a bit of an insight into some of these books and give you my review of the books. Um, obviously, the, the best one of all time is Rex Moss at the Moose That Roared. Uh, go back and listen to that uh, that segment, which is on YouTube as well. Um, but yeah, an- another one I read was uh, Ken Arthurson. It's called Great Book. Arco, My Game. Great book. The best thing about this book is when it came out. So it came out in 1997 during the Super League War. Yeah. And this guy was just an open wound. Like I am, I'm surprised that he's still alive. The the way he he sounded in that book. As a side note, he was a guest at Origin this week. Uh, the, really? Um, in the in the yeah, box, yeah. So oh, okay. which I thought was a lovely touch. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Given the service to the game and, mm, and whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. Really funny character in the game of rugby league, Ken Arthurson. I remember in Fatty's book, he'd say that every time he'd go in to negotiate with Arco. He'd, he'd leave there thinking, um, oh, what a great deal I've made. And then when he'd drive it home, he'd go, he's got me again. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the book you go to if you want like a, you know, what's and all unbiased account of what happened in the Super League era. It It's incredibly slanted <laughs> in, in one direction, which obviously you can understand that. Um but just as a historical document, it's fascinating. The, the time it came out, the insight it gives into some of the causes of the Super League War. And just the... Uh, he's, he's kind of introspective and, and open to the idea that the, the ARL wasn't perfect. But every step of the way, he kind of obfuscates and, and gives account <laughs> for anything that didn't happen and why it wasn't really his fault. And you remember when we were growing up, the knock on Arthurson was always like, he's the boss of the ARL, but he seems to think that the ARL consists of Manly and no other team. That was a massive knock on him. <laughs> and uh, so he had, there was a lot of resentment about Arco for that. And statements like this do nothing to appease <laughs> any potential detractors. I happened to, this is like page two. So it's <laughs> right out of the gate. This is how he wants to, to frame his narrative. I happen to be associated with Manly Club, a place which has been increasingly resented down the seasons by others jealous of Manly's front-running efforts in the area of professionalism, recruitment, and their single-minded search for success. Manly became very unpopular simply because they made the mistake of trying to be the best. <laughs> Uh, and then he goes on. I've been accused of being manipulative, of playing favourites, of being a politician wearing a footballer's hat. I stoutly deny the charges, all of them. Although perhaps I do have an Achilles heel. I confess freely that I suffer terminally from the condition of deep loyalty to things I love, such as the club which has been part of m- my life for most of my life, and to the game of rugby league itself. Later in the book he says, I've never lobbied for anyone that I didn't think it was, was worth it. Sure, I lobbied for Bob Fulton to be captain of Australia. Sure, I lobbied for Max Krilich to be captain of Australia. <laughs> but I did it because I genuinely believe they were the best man for the job. How is Max Krilich the best man for the job? Like he was, 82, wasn't it? He, he was the, the captain of, of the Invincibles. <laughs> I mean, I don't remember him as a player too, too before mm. our time, but I mean... But- I mean, there was Wally Lewis. There was, uh, there was all sorts of players in that era. But yeah, just that's the that's the person Arco was. He just cares too much. <laughs> <laughs> but also, um, I've I've never been biased, but I've got deep loyalty for Manly. It's been part of my life for my, the whole time. Um, the other thing the book does really well is is talk about the era of the sixties and seventies, the the way the game was run back then. We've talked about on the show before those boardroom meetings <laughs> and uh, Arco's insight into the boardroom meetings are like so good. So he became club sec- manly secretary in 63, I think it was. That long ago. Yeah, yeah. well, just all right, brief recap of Ken Arthurson's career. So 
He started playing for Manly as a halfback in the late 40s. Wow. Um, I didn't know he was that old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Suffered a, he's late 80s now. He's in his 80s, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he suffered a horrific injury while he was playing in the bush in 53, I think it was. Um, like, legitimately could have died. Had like a knee go into his skull and, you know. Jesus. Um, so that ended his playing career when he was, you know, early, mid-20s. He went on to rise through the ranks of Manly uh, as a coach. Was first grade coach there from 57 through 61, I believe. And um, had some success, took him to grand finals. Uh, then decided he was done with coaching, became a club official. Became secretary in 63, or maybe 64. And in 65, became one of the first club secretaries to be full-time paid in that role. I mean, from that time onwards, everyone in the Northern Beaches, the most used word of the year would be Arco. Yeah, yeah. Just the mayor of Manly. Yeah. Right? And he, the, his rise to um, power at Manly coincided with a few other then young guys coming through and shaking it up from the, you know... He came in just after the Jersey flag era and came in under the leadership of Bill Buckley, who, who'd been around for, you know, decades. So Bill Buckley was a little younger than those old Harold Matthews, Jersey flag era, but still of the old school. Then you had Arco come in with Bullfrog Moore, with Kevin Humphreys. Uh, it just makes me laugh. The dinosaurs were once the... Um, I know, I know, yeah. The I, layers. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll, re- I'll read you this. Um, it always worried me and still nags at me now that Buckley had the wrong perception of me. I remember years ago someone telling me, it might have been Ken McCaffrey, of Buckley's opinion of Kevin Humphreys and myself, the two, the best two young delegates in the game, in the league. But Buckley went on to venture the opinion that Arthurson didn't like him very much. It was only a small thing, but it worried me greatly. Not only did I like Bill Buckley, I really respected him. So, so yeah, just him and, and Bullfrog as these two like young bucks coming through <laughs> and shaking things up. Um, but, but those meetings, we've talked about it before, what a like, wild, raucous night it would have been. And Arco gets into it here. Jeez, it used to get heated down there. And now and then the odd punch would be thrown. <laughs> I was there on the night of the famous blue in which two red-faced officials wrestled through the committee room doors and spilled out into the (laughs) corridor. (laughs) But but then, the the rugby league trope of all rugby league tropes. I learned a lot about rugby league and rugby league men on those long Monday nights at Phillips Street. No matter how fierce the tussle had been during the meeting itself, Afterwards, a keg would be tapped in the tiny bar in the corner, snacks wheeled in, and peace and mateship in a shared interest would prevail. <laughs> it's just the greatest. You're going to have a keg every Monday. <laughs> he says, The night would end invariably the way it does after a good hard football match. Some yarns and conviviality, an ale or two, and some pleasure in experience shared. I love it because they're all ex-players, so that's the only way <laughs> of getting things done they know. All right, like, you just go hard, like, bash each other for 80 minutes, and then you have a beer afterwards, you know. They bring that spirit to the boardroom. It's the spirit that's the essence of the game and what's held the game back yeah. for 100 years. <laughs> Absolutely. Um and then, of course, like, it, it was under Arthurson's leadership that Manly bega- became to be viewed as poachers and buying premierships, the rest of it. Um, you, you know my stance on that. I don't give two hoots about local juniors. No, yeah. Like, did you look in the record books and it says how many local juniors the premiers mm. had? No. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, yeah, so in the early 70s, they were basically raiding other clubs, South in South in particular. They got Lurch O'Neill, Ray Brannigan, um, Gary Stevens, they, they got in. The John O'Neill uh poaching was a massive deal, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um Treason. Treasonous. Yeah, yeah. Um Sattler's Sattler's biography, which is which is worth a an episode in itself, uh he talks about the sense of betrayal he felt when Lurch told him about it. And so I think Lurch went at the end of 71. When he told Sattler, Sattler said, 
but they're the bastards that broke my jaw. <laughs> All roads in rugby league lead back to Sattler's broken jaw. It's inescapable. <laughs> um, but back to Arco and the way he signed players. Just the way he like explained. It's one that you, you've said it. You don't care about local juniors, and and if you are a, a club boss, you should be going after the best players in the game. There's nothing wrong with it. But the way he frames it, I'll, I'll just read this out. Um, so they got Ken Irvine from North in, in the early 70s to come across. And he said, We never brought across players to Manly without them being absolutely convinced that it was what they wanted to do. Irvine, a player of legendary status by that time, was an outstanding example of that. I remember so clearly the conversation I had with him before he joined us. Ken, do you really think you should leave North? I asked him. <laughs> You're a legend there. You're a life member there. You're going to be giving up such a lot. I want you to think long and hard about what you're contemplating. That didn't happen. <laughs> There's no way that happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's sad to think of Ken Irvine like ending up in a manly jersey after being so iconic with Norths. I agree, but it happens to almost every great player. Exactly. And unlike what happens to most great players, he left a club that did very little the, the whole time he was there, ended up winning two premierships at Manly and retiring. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So he got the ending he deserved. Yeah, there it is. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to see one club play as much as the next bloke, but it's not going to happen... You you slow down a bit. They don't want to pay you the big money. Mm. It happens ninety five percent of yeah. the players. Yeah. So so yeah. So Arthurson was genuinely ahead of his time in that regard, and you got to give him some respect for that. He must have been a. Uh, I'll give him enormous respect for his contribution to the game. His legendary figure. Um, mm. Just that he must have just been a great salesman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, charismatic guy. So obviously. For a bloke who's been involved in the, the game for so long, the book basically goes from 1948 to 1997 and he's active every step of the way. It's not one of these biographies where you have 300 pa- pages on 10 years of footy in, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. 60s and then, um, and me and my wife Gail live a lovely life on the Gold Coast and, you know, I, I still see Sats and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> still see Sats at the Kangaroos reunions. And... But I tell you what, that talking about what sort of um, personality he is, he dominated every year. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like even now, he's still referred to with like this Godfather, mm. Don Corleone style yeah. reverence. Yeah, you'd think uh, Brookie would give him a better stand, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> when your best stands a black shed, <laughs> it's a bit hard. <laughs> uh, so- the other interesting thing he touches on is the the Kevin Humphreys scandal in '83. That's got to be a history corner. Yeah, I'm yeah. saving that one into the inbox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. We'll, we'll work on that. So I won't go into it in too much detail. But it was just I don't know. I found it quite touching the way he spoke about Kevin Humphreys, and obviously Humphreys was his own worst enemy. Um, got himself into a lot of trouble with his gambling. Can relate to that, Kevin. Yeah. Um, you hear a lot of, you know, untoward stories about that era, which, which we won't touch on here. But uh, Darcy Lawless backed him. <laughs> uh, maybe a, another referee of the time. <laughs> in, in... Hollywood's backed him. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, it was the Humphreys' downfall that installed Arthurson into the top job at at the New South Wales Rugby League um, and chairman of the ARL. And you can't deny that he got the job done and was actively trying to push the game forward. Absolutely. Started with axing Newtown, um, which take the emotion out of it. Like it, it made economic sense. Should have axed five more at the same time. Yeah, well, they tried to axe West's um, court action. Like West just dug their heels in. I don't think Newtown were in a financial position to keep the fight going. Well, Singer was running it back then, wasn't he? Mm. So he's a businessman first yeah. and foremost. 
And then obviously the big one was bringing in the Broncos along with the the Knights and the Gold Coast in 88. Looking at it, it's a no-brainer now. But at the time, it was considered, what the hell is going on? This is a Sydney game and this is bringing mm. the Brisbane comp down. And, and half of that was coming from the Brisbane rugby league yeah, yeah. who knew that the writing was on the wall if, if the Broncos got in. I think the section of Arco's book which talks about the Broncos era is as compelling as the Super League part. But don't forget the Knights. Yeah. Two cornerstones of the game mm. brought in under his rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and in the case of the Knights, like, bring back a foundation club. Yeah, but no one thought, everyone thought, you know, it's a rugby league heartland, blah, 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 but no one thought it was going to turn into mm. what it did. Yeah. It's just like, you know, they're triers, you know, mm. they were triers back then even. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Henny Penny were there from the <laughs> they, they believed. All due respect to Henny Penny. <laughs> um, so there were three different uh, bids going for the Brisbane team. There was one... Um, Owned by the guy from Jeans West. There, there was a, <laughs> was it a rebel ticket. <laughs> um, the Sattler's book actually he was he was involved with one of the bids for a while. And, Is the Jeans West boss in the Thoroughbreds? Uh, no, because the Thoroughbreds were the the Paul Porky Morgan camp <laughs> who who won out who won the bid in the end. Um, a good friend of mine went to uni with his daughter. Really? And reckons he's a legend, or was a legend, Wasn't, yeah. was a legend bloke. Really? Um, used to enjoy a um, large bowl of ice cream nightly, apparently. Um, and I suggest that might, might, might have <laughs> contributed to his unfortunate demise, but um reckon he's, he was the best bloke ever. Yeah, right. And, and yeah, so basically, the way Arthurson tells it, it's almost as if, Super League was inevitable from the moment the Broncos got in. Uh, I'll, I'll read this quote. In hindsight, one of the worst decisions we ever made at Phillips Street was the one that allowed the Brisbane Broncos into the competition. Right there, in one generous gesture by the league, in the interest of ex expanding our horizons, was sown the seed of the Super League treachery. And then Arthurson goes on to say that he favoured the Jeans West bid, um, but was eventually sold on the Broncos. We let them in. After a good deal of toying and throwing up there and gave them free access, we gave them virtually a license to print money in that one team, one city setup. They joined and initially did a good job. But almost from the start, they were too self-centered, too greedy. They just didn't give a bugger about anyone else. Everything was so sweet for the Broncos from the moment they stepped into big time football. They drew huge crowds. Their sponsorship return returns were spectacular. They were soon making millions. In double quick time, they became the first club to ever actually make a profit out of rugby league. <laughs> How sad is that? <laughs> we had crowds bursting out of grounds mm. in the 60s in Australia, in, yeah. in Sydney. The first club to ever make a profit. Like it's some sort of unattainable feat. <laughs> it is funny that they're sitting around going, these guys are making money. <laughs> It's nothing never changed. No, but to be fair, uh, the model of most rugby league clubs up until, it, I don't know when it changed, but they weren't money making ventures. Anything that that they that came in was redistributed. So if you look at those balance sheets, yeah, the pl the plus and minus always square up. But let's just look at it. We've got a professional sporting competition with a whole bunch of fans and a whole bunch of merchandise clubs full of gambling machines stealing money from the vulnerable which they get free money from and they still can't <laughs> turn a profit sponsorship what is going on mm. i'll never i'll never understand no that. the first club to make a profit <laughs> yeah. and apparently because of that they they were like swanning into phillips street just <laughs> like you know <laughs> Like wearing sunglasses, <laughs> and like, you know, splashing cash around. And... Oh, straight away they were looking for any sort of hilariousness. Yeah, there. yeah. And then they they knew the position they were in as as the first money making venture in rugby league history. So they were kind of throwing their weight around at board meetings, not taking rules seriously because they knew that there was nothing they could do. Um, you know, they were breaking rules. And Arthurson actually said that. At certain points, they were considering kicking them out of the competition. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you imagine it? <laughs> the biggest success story in the history of the game. <laughs> My favourite quote. This this is where maybe we're too hard on rugby league. Maybe it's a more general problem. Because Arthurson was talking about, um, you know, the money side of things. And he, he said, anyone going into it who thinks he's going to make a lump of money is having himself on. It's always been a struggle in Australia. The president of the Washington Redskins got it right when someone asked him one day if it was possible to make a small fortune out of sport. Easy, he replied. Just start out with a large fortune. <laughs> I've got a great line. <laughs> That's why I always respect guys like Rusty mm. that do it for the love of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Rusty's not making a ton of money in the South, you can bet your bottom mm. dollar. And I, I think that's probably what puts someone like Arthurson offside with, you know, blokes of the Broncos coming in and, you know, flashing their money around. Because he g- genuinely was into the rugby league side of things. And Yeah, uh, no disrespect against Ken Arthurson, old school guy, legendary, but when you make... When you finance your bloody sport with poker machines, mm. I've got no sympathy for, yeah. for the fact yeah. you can't make money. Yeah, yeah, very true. It's funny the section where he, where he's talking about John Rebo. So Rebo, Reeves, uh, John Rebo de Bressac, as he was, <laughs> was known. Uh, so he was chief executive of the Broncos from the start, and that's how he became involved in Super League. And Do you think the French side really annoyed Arco as well? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> like, it's a Larish name. Yeah, it really is. But yeah, so obviously uh, Rebo had played under Arthurson at Manly in the early 80s. So they had like a working relationship and he, he liked him. In the book, Said Arthurson said, he was an affable and popular club man and a darn good footballer. I remember reading that as a teenager and thinking... That's quite um, yeah. nice of Arco to... Yeah, yeah. Uh, he said even at, at the at the heart of it, they had a they ran in, into each other at, at an airport once, like during the Super League War, and just had an amicable, amicable conversation. They didn't talk about football, just, you know... A real old school. Yeah, man. yeah. Love yeah, that. Yeah. And his parting words on Rebo were, I'm sure that Rebo and I will always have a civil relationship. There's some mutual respect there from years ago, and of course it doesn't all evaporate. There are plenty of blokes on the Super League side that I wouldn't want to talk to. Rebo isn't one of them. Um, he didn't talk to Bullfrog more again, did he? They, yeah, they, so they did. So he, he talks about the um, the treachery of some of the club bosses. Peter Gow is one that he felt betrayed by, and um, I doubt they ever spoke again not as portrayed as uh barry beef yeah <laughs> so what what he says about bullfrogs actually quite moving um i'll read it out april fool's day 1995 is a day i'll never forget with the stories and rumors raging around us and separation of one from the other just about impossible we held an emergency board meeting at the new south wales leagues club it was the day that peter moore one of my closest friends for 30 years resigned I was in the league very early that morning. Peter rang home and told Barbara that he needed to see me. She told him I was already at Phillips Street. Our meeting in the boardroom on the first floor had just begun when there was a knock on the door. It was Peter. Could I see you privately for a few moments, he said to me. I excused myself and we headed across to one of the one of the officers. There Moore said to me, I'm sorry to tell you this, mate, but I'm going to have to resign. All my players have signed to go over to Super League. I've no option but to step down. I was rocked by the news. Have you given it plenty of thought? I asked him. He said he had. I'm sorry to see you go, I said. Obviously, you've given a lot of consideration and feel you have no choice. And that was it. Four or five minutes, a few words, and it was over. We shook hands and I went back to the meeting. There I broke the news of Moore's resignation. In the months following, it became a sore point for some people in the game that he and I kept in some sort of contact. But the friendship had been a close one for so long, an important one to both of us. It was no easy thing to throw away. The Peter Peter Moore situation was hard for me. We'd always been there for each other when things were tough. It was a very personal blow to me to realise he wouldn't be alongside to help fight the battle. That gives me chills. But the fact highlights how close they are is he calls Barbara at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, seriously, Mm. how close Mm. is this game back then? Yeah. And uh, earlier in the book, when he's talking about his role at Manly in the 70s, 
He said that him and Bullfrog had a standing agreement that they wouldn't poach each other's players. This is what I wanted to bring up with you. This is ongoing now with Gus and Nick Pilates. How can you be a proper club boss when you rule out four clubs yeah, because yeah. you're mates with the yeah. guy? Like, mm-hmm. So, so you, you can sign Cooper Cronk, but I've got too much respect for uh, yeah, yeah. Bellamy, so I'm not going to approach his players. <laughs> like, what is that? As a fan, like, do you want that bloke leading a club to know that he's not going to have your best interests as a club at heart because he wants to preserve his friendship? Do you know what? That's actually in breach of the Corporations Act. If it's a public corporation, if you're not acting in the best cor- interest of the corporation, mm. you go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. So you can sign um, um, Boyd Cordner, but no, nah, Uncle Nick's got him on. <laughs> so out of respect, I'm not going to sign him. But I mean, the relationships, like, I mean, to call his wife at home. Mm. The only thing I can think of is. As close as is me and Sean McRae's wife <laughs> when I called up as a teenager, but um, yeah, it's, it just gives you chills. Mm. Um, so we'll turn to the Super League side of it. This is just an aside, but it, it was just it made me laugh too hard to not share it with you now. Um, we launched the nineteen ninety five season with a slap up dinner at the Entertainment Centre in Sydney, hooking up with the four new clubs via giant TV screens. Mal Meninga, Australia's captain and not long back from his history-making fourth kangaroo tour, took to the stage to, league, to launch League's brave new world of 1995. Mid-dinner, the curtain swished open to reveal the lush sounds of Yanni and his orchestra. <laughs> Rugby League had never been more ritzy. <laughs> Isn't that just so quaint? <laughs> We're getting Yanni. Oh, really? <laughs> like, I don't know if Yanni was ever, like, cool. But, like, 1995. <laughs> like, come on. Barely like getting, like, Andre Real now. <laughs> it's so funny. So, refresh me. I mean, I lived through this. And I, still, I, I put it out of my mind almost. But 95 was the year... Super League was um, signed in early 95, but they yeah. played the season out. Yeah. In 96. So, so 95, yeah, you, you had the players signed, then there was the court action. Then uh, it was late 95, I think, that the the ruling came down in favour of the ARL. Yeah. Um, then, then in 96, obviously, the comp continued as one with the, the appeal going. So um, honestly, if we had those expansion teams and got rid of some Sydney teams, it would have been the greatest thing ever. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you can take this with a grain of salt, but when Arthurson talks about the that expansion, he didn't view view it as a 20-team comp long term. He said, already at Phillip Street, we decided to give the 20-team format two years to settle in and at that point to begin the hard steps towards rationalisation, the reducing of the number of Sydney clubs. So this is what I say to this day. They bought it upon themselves by not doing it earlier. Mm. If they'd done it earlier, the game would have been far stronger yeah. and they wouldn't have had to be in that position. Yeah. I know um, it's tough, but... Yeah, yeah. And and Arson, you can tell, feels betrayed particularly by the three new clubs that sign with Super League months after their first game, yeah. not, like weeks after their first game, really. Um, which is, is pretty astounding when you think about it. But it's just that thing where you think, who's going to win? Yeah, and <laughs> if if you're the Warriors, if you're the Cowboys, if you're the Reds, and you've been given this vision of a global game, you know, one team, one city kind of thing, you, you're given that vision against an alternative of playing like playing north, you know, playing north, <laughs> playing west, you know, playing like there appears to be a tree in the uh, oval. <laughs> <laughs> We're at Leichhardt. Um, that gentleman appears to be watching the game from his bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is what I still maintain. The vision is what we're all aspiring to eventually. Mm. Yeah, I don't want. Um, 8,000 people at a suburban ground. No. 
It's quaint, but it's yeah. not sustainable. Yeah. I, I don't know. When I read that about how, you know, the ARL was planning to, to rationalize and, you know, give the four new clubs a chance to settle in and then make the decision on which Sydney clubs had to go. Part of me thinks that he's just saying that. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. The reason that they were put in that position where a media company could put them to the sword like that was because they dragged the chain for 20 years. Yeah. Mm. He got rid of Newtown. He saw yeah. the benefit of that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you can't be too critical of him. In that time, he did get rid of Newtown. He tried to get rid of West. He true, brought in true. the three new clubs. True, he true, brought true. in four more. All true. Uh, but yeah, maybe some missteps along the way. And I think he sees himself as the guy who was going to revolutionise the game and then it was taken out of his hands. Yeah. Mm. Um, what I don't like through the whole Super League war, I was always in Newcastle a pariah because I, I, I supported the concept of Super League. I didn't want the war, but um, I was going to Mariners games just to annoy people. <laughs> um, um, but the, um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, to, to, to say Kerry Pack is some sort of like um, martyr in the whole thing, if they just worked out a deal between the pay TV companies before they sunk two hundred million dollars mm. each, yeah, yeah, the game would have been ten yeah. times stronger. Mm. It's funny you mentioned Packer because so obviously Packer like came out strong in favour of the ARL, and then once he saw there was money to be made from Super League, wanted a piece of that and ended up getting the rights for Monday Night Football. RK would have been devil. Oh, I'll, I'll read this. So, so this is um, Arthurson speaking about when he first spoke to Packer about the Super League concept. So this was the World Sevens in 1995. It, it was, was going to revolutionise the game. game. <laughs> in Packer's box at the SFS that day, I said to him, Kerry, I'm genuinely concerned about all this. I went on to raise the issue of docu- the document presented by John Singleton to Canterbury CEO Peter Moore. I said to Packer, I wouldn't have thought that John Singleton would have put forward a proposal like that without your knowledge. Packer didn't answer that and I pressed on. What I'm getting around to, Kerry, is this. I wouldn't like to think that you would do a deal with News Limited and leave us out in the cold. It was then that Packer uttered the words I would never forget, assuring me he would be doing no deal with News Limited. I put out my hand and looked him square in the eye. Thank you, Kerry. I appreciate that, I said. I would have bet my life on Packer honouring that pledge. For a start, why? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I mean, he's old school and a handshake meant handshake. That's why he would think that. <laughs> yeah, well, he's old school, yeah. but I mean, if he's running the ARL, he should realise that Kerry Packer <laughs> presented himself as an old school guy, but was... You, you might remember something called World Series <laughs> Cricket. <laughs> Um, And when the betrayal ultimately came, it was basically the straw that broke the camel's back. He said, Channel 9's move dragged me down about as far as it was possible for a fundamentally positive person like myself to go. I just started to feel that I couldn't take it anymore. And when I started to think like that, I was also figuring I'm not going to be much use to anybody if I'm in this frame of mind. And um, yeah, so he stepped down later that year. It's like a great tragedy. Mm, mm-hmm. It's kind of sad to see you guys put that much into the game go out like that. Yeah, yeah, it, it really it's, is. Outside his own control, really. Yeah. I mean, you could say you should have acted faster, but you're dealing with a rugby league, nothing goes fast. And he, he really did leave the game a broken man, which is my, my ultimate takeaway from that book is like, oh my God, like whatever you want to say about his failings, like this is, this is tough to read. I'll, I'll read this. I left football disappointed and with not much more than faint hope for the future. It was not the way I would have chosen to go. In the previous two years, many things I had believed in had been challenged and in some cases destroyed forever. The game that had been my life had been tossed around like a cork on stormy waters. Its very long-term existence threatened by those unholy partners in crime. Bronco greed and the ruthless corporate ambition of News Limited. I think it's kind of simplistic. I mean, the, the ruthless was on the Optus side as well. Oh, yeah. Um, but you're right. That's tragic. Um, I, yeah, I don't. I don't want to minimise or downplay Arthurson's own failings and the ARL's own failings. Um, Not to mention the um, grand final um, entertainment with, with the TV <laughs> falling down. But uh, Optus Vision. That's that's just rugby league's luck, isn't it? <laughs> 
the A Rod could do nothing about that, but it happened. You know, like it's laughed about to this day. <laughs> Honestly, I remember reading this as a, as a young man, teenager, and um, it moved me then. But I mean, in my view, he's up there with Daily Messenger and guys like that that put their heart and soul into mm. it. And without them, we wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah, seriously. Um, it might be just a suburban game with five thousand people there without us. And... Yeah, yeah, definitely true. Very, very complicated figure in rugby league, but you can't deny his contribution. And my ultimate takeaway from this book is like this guy loves rugby league. Yeah, like Craig Foster, like level <laughs> love of his sport. <laughs> Check the book out. That we, we've really just skimmed the surface, especially with the Super League stuff. One thing I wanted to bring up was Quail. Yeah. I mean, that was a great dynamic duo. Mm, Two yeah. ex-players to be such great administrators. Yeah, yeah. Um, and against the odds of 150,000 other crappy administrators. And he speaks so glowingly of Quail. Like, you could tell the love was there. It was, you know, a re- really good working partnership. And, and Quail was actually instrumental in, in one of the, the biggest innovations in rugby league history. Kicking deep. Bigger. <laughs> Tina Turner. Oh, my God. <laughs> she, he was basically her liaison through, throughout the whole thing. Like, she was the, he was the one she dealt with. And, yeah, so he, he is the genius who brought that to be. <laughs> so what did Colin Love bring into the game? <laughs> but, yeah, so I don't want to touch too much on the Super League stuff because we could – we could do 10 episodes on, on the Super League War. Which I think we should. Which we, we should and will. Um, but yeah, so check the book out. It's called Arco My Game, uh, written by Arthurson and Ian Heads, of course. Who, Legendary figures in their own right. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to say, these books, the, the ones that came on the 90s, they're really hard to track down. I've had, I had a lot of trouble finding them. You can't just go to the bookstore. Go to your local library. I'm not just saying this as a plug to my trade. I'm saying it because that's where you're going to get these books. If they don't have it at your local library, do an interlibrary loan. You can get it from somewhere else. You know where I sourced mine from in the 90s? Toronto Library. Really? Yep. Yeah. So there you go. Um, Yeah. Heaps of great resources. Uh, Yeah. But so anyway, uh, I, I highly recommend reading Arco My Game. Just one more thing. My Game. Yeah, bit of yeah, yeah. <laughs> not our game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's this week's history corner. That was great. <laughs>